Hi all, I'm Joel Lindecker. I'm a first year PhD student in the Safari Research Group and I will show to you some of our recent work uh, in accelerating genomics, um, in particular using GPUs to accelerate the GeneASM algorithm. So let's start with uh, some background on genome sequencing and analysis. So genome sequencing enables us to determine the order uh, of DNA sequence in an organism's genome. Um, so this genome is a set of chromosomes. Humans have uh, 23 pairs of such, of such molecules and each of these is a long string of ACGT characters twisted in a double helix. Um, and th these DNA molecules, they capture a majority of the hereditary information that yeah, an organism carries, for example, in humans, uh, eye color or susceptibility to certain illnesses or uh, how well someone would react to a medication. Um, so it plays a pivotal role uh, in uh, yeah, anal analyzing this genome. It plays a pivotal role in personalized medicine, uh, outbreak tracing and understanding of evolution. Um, now, there's some challenges here, because if you want to look um, if you want to computationally analyze such a genome, you have to take some kind of physical sample and get a digital version of it. For that, you need a sequencing machine, and uh, these sequencing machines um, take uh, a long... No, none of these take a long DNA as input and give the entire thing in one piece as an output. So what they do instead is all sequencing machines get small randomized fragments of this uh, genome um, as an output. This poses some computational challenges, which uh, yeah, we target in bioinformatics. So um, let's quickly look at the full pipeline. So we start with some kind of sample collection from a human. This could be, uh, let's say, some blood that we get from a human. Uh, it's followed up by some preparation steps. So we, um, yeah, it's just like chemistry, um, where DNA fragments will be uh, chopped up and potentially modified, but these are still molecules that are sent around. And so we put this in a sequencing machine and out we get uh, sequenced reads. Now these sequenced reads are a digital version of the chopped DNA fragments. And yeah, the, the, so, so when you, we talk about reads, we really mean a string of ACGT characters um, or so characters we call base pairs and the entire string is a read. We then run a genome sequence analysis step. So this is purely computational over this digital data. And we run, run this computational analysis step on top of it. This is what in the end gives us all the output we're desiring. Now let's briefly look at these machines because these really affect what we need to do in the downstream stage here. So these sequencing machines, um, there's a bunch of technologies and some of the most popular ones are, for example, ONT, uh, PacBio or Illumina. And these have different properties because some of them are more accurate, some of them are uh, faster, cheaper, whatever. But uh, the most important thing for now is that um, the, it's really the cost reduction that these technologies have brought us in the last years. So uh, let's say if, if in 2001 the um, computational capability was uh, in line with the amount of the cost and throughput of uh, sequencing machines, then this kind of stayed in line with Moore's law until 2007, but then you saw a significant drop in sequencing cost and hence also throughput of sequencing machines, um, or let's say total throughput in the world. Um, and, and so, so what you see here is that really we can now sequence much more gene data and do it much more cheaply than uh, Moore's law has scaled. So we don't have, let's say, the raw computational power hasn't improved as much as, uh, as the data. Um, so what we need to do now is have a smarter, more intelligent architectures, so we use our transistors in a better way, or we could uh, also have the same architectures but with better programs, so optimizing CPU and GPU code. Um, but anyway, the, po the entire point here is now that computation is a bottleneck these days, um, and we need to be smart about how to deal with all this data. So, uh, 
with, with that out of the way, uh, let's let's briefly look how these computational steps look. Um, we get these reads from the sequencing machine, and we do read mapping, most typically for medical applications, for example. So we have some kind of reference genome. We know that a human genome looks in a certain way, and um, so we have one fully like, one full sequence of a human genome, and we get these chopped fragments of that similar genome um, that we just sequenced and we try to find what's the best locations where each of those fragments can fit. So this is process is called mapping, finding the best location of a fragment relative to a reference genome. Uh, alternatively to this you could also do de novo assembly where there's no reference genome and we find an assembled version just based on uh, yeah, overlaps between these reads. So this is computationally uh, much more expensive because you don't have this extra information from the reference genome and that's why uh, we will for now focus on the read mapping which uh, yeah is, is the more standard thing to do because it's at least somewhat cheaper so when we do a genome sequence analysis with read mapping um, uh, this is, will be always the first step for some medical applications and as i said we align reads to one or more possible locations within the reference genome and what we, our goal is, is to find matches and difference between the read and the reference genome at that location. Um, so what, how we do this alignment or how we find this best location is we do approximate string matching. Um, and what, what approximate string matching allows us about to do as opposed to exact string matching is to account for sequencing errors and genetic variations. So I mentioned earlier that the machines I showed they are not always 100% accurate. They make some mistakes. As they vary between technologies, some of them are like 0.05% errors. Some of them have up to like 5 or 10% errors. Um, so if you have errors in your strings, you cannot do exact sequence search. Um, instead, you have to do an approximate search where you allow some kind of errors, and still you want to find the location that has at least the fewest number of errors. Um, and then there can be, of course, uh, genetic variations in the same line, but here it's not the machine that does the, the mistake, but rather uh, that our reference genome that we map to um, is genetically different than the human that we sequenced, uh, whose DNA we sequenced. Now, um, these steps are yeah, bottlenecked by the computational power and memory bandwidth of existing systems. And yeah, this is the point where this approximate string matching is really uh, one of the main bottlenecks and that's what we also are trying to accelerate. Um, but uh, that's, yeah, this introduction I want to give on genomics. You can find more on our PNS genomics courses. There's a lot of great materials in there. Um, but for now, let's, let's focus on this approximate string matching. So in approximate string matching, uh, we have a sequenced genome that may not exactly map uh, as we said due to these variations and sequencing errors so let's say we have a reference in the read and um, you can kind of see they already look somewhat similar but actually there is a deletion in here so a character that appears in the reference but was missing in the read um, there can be substitutions in here so characters that occur but are actually different in the read this could be uh, a genetic variation or a mistake by the sequencing machine um, or an insertion a character that for whatever reason occurred in the read but actually wasn't in the reference and now approximate string matching tries to account for all of these it tries to find the differences and also similarities between the two sequences and uh, yeah we've used this to find the minimum edit distance so a minimum edit distance is kind of our uh, optimization target we try to find whatever mapping location and uh, edit sequence has the fewest total number of edits in there. And in addition to the fewest number of edits, we also want the optimal alignment. So this is really the exact sequence of edits here. So the first thing is the, exact, the optimal number of edits and here is also the exact, no, the exact sequence of edits. We usually compute this using dynamic programming algorithms um, so this might be one that you have seen in uh, some introductory algorithms course at ETH. 
Um, I think at least computer science uh, students should have seen this one. Uh, it's called um, yeah, Walker Fisher or Smith Waterman algorithm. Um, and what we have here is, is let's say you have the reference sequence and the read, and we build a two dimensional table. So this is one of the most common al algorithms used for this and has quadratic uh, space and time complexity because clearly you're filling uh, a tab quadratic table of numbers. <clears throat> now, alternatively to this, this number-based arithmetic-based dynamic programming, you can do bit vector-based dynamic programming. Um, and this is called the byte algorithm, this example. So you build this still a uh, table that's still two-dimensional uh, with different axes than before. Um, and entries are bit vectors instead of numbers. So really each of these bits we are considering as Boolean values and not as numbers. Um, so this will be the algorithm that we will try to optimize later on GPU. So uh, let's quickly look at some pseudocode here. So it consists of a two dimensional loop, of course, because we fill a two dimensional table and the actual computation is all bitwise operations. So this is really the motivation for doing this as opposed to the arithmetic dynamic programming. Bitwise operations can be um, much more efficient and especially implemented in hardware. And depending on the architecture, this might also have, for example, lower latency to execute uh, or higher throughput. Um, and then of course there's some kind of output calculation. And uh, notably in this case, actually the output is only the number of errors. So this algorithm as it stands here right now can only determine the optimum number of errors. Um, but as we discussed, uh, actually we need traceback for the genomic workload. So if you have only the optimal number of errors, this really corresponds to, let's say the optimal cell um, in this kind of table layout and uh, the uh, yeah, optimal sequence of edits is a path in reverse. So this 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 uh, optimal sequence of, of edits can be determined by following um, traceback, uh, a traceback algorithm, which tries to find where at each step along the way the partial optimal solution was. And if you concatenate these partial optimal solutions, that's uh, yeah, your optimal sequence of edits. And we also call this the cigar string in genomics. Now, uh, the byte of algorithm that I showed doesn't, didn't originally at least, uh, come with this support uh, for this traceback step. So here we come to this uh, genasm work of, uh, yeah, le led by my uh, master thesis advisor, uh, Damla. Um, and so they proposed genasm. Um, and among other things, so they uh, hardware accelerated by tap, but they also, um, algorithmically extended the byte algorithm so that it has traceback and there's some kind of performance improvement so uh, that the windowing heuristic and some yeah they showed that there's actually parallelism in this algorithm um, let's not get into these uh, but uh, let's quickly look at this traceback thing which is a necessity for us so this was the uh, algorithm that we had and uh, what um, Damla had all figured out in a uh, their work back in micro 2020, they figured out that you can just store these intermediate bit vectors. Um, so all of these across all two loop iterations, all of these two um, iterations of the two loops, and you follow a trail of zeros in stored bit vectors in the reverse. And this will be yeah, the optimal sequence of edits. So now we have full algorithm and um, well, they showed in this work kind of that, oh, there, there's, this works really nicely in hardware, it's highly efficient. And uh, they showed that this has also some parallelism. And of course, at this point, we were motivated also. If you have parallelism and uh, it's already quite efficient, um, it kind of makes sense to try and implement this on GPUs and see how it works. So first implementation attempt for this algorithm I could be to take this existing C code um, with CUDA, have some minor changes in it. Um, but uh, yeah, just take the CPU code and recompile it. Um, and then, of course, you have one GPU thread per sequence pair if you are no more specific than just taking CPU code. And uh, we used global memory at first. So 
you don't have to worry too much about capacity issues or anything like that. And um, well, this uh, immediately leads to actually a suboptimal performance. So if we look at a roofline model, um, this is of an NVIDIA A6000 GPU, this is a Ampere, so it's the most recent architecture of NVIDIA. It's a very big GPU. And this is the roofline model. Um, so you have the bandwidth of global and shared memory and a peak compute throughput. And if we store the DP table in global memory, as we did here, we actually notice in this roofline model that we would be severely memory bound. So we, we drew the um, operational intensity of the genasm algorithm. And at the intersection point, we see this is the maximum attainable um, throughput that you could ever get. And it's far from what the peak throughput could be, uh, the computational throughput could be of the GPU. So we don't really like that for a computational problem. Um, we would prefer to be somewhere close up to here, at least in terms of peak performance. But due to the global memory bandwidth, we will be limited to this kind of performance. So as a second implementation attempt, um, we could try to keep everything the same, um, but replace uh, the global memory with shared memory. So that's where we put the DP table. Um, and indeed, right, this has much, much higher bandwidth and because it's uh, on chip and very close to the actual um, functional units of the SM. Uh, and now indeed we can uh, be compute bound, at least in theory, um, according to this roofline model. But as you know, this shared memory actually has much, much lower capacity compared to global memory. Um, and uh, yeah, in this context, we maybe should look at how much this will be an issue for us here. So this was what the uh, trace spec algorithm does, right? It, it stores all these bit vectors and afterwards has to use them to uh, trace back through. And then we can quickly yeah, calculate the memory footprint over this. So let's see, we have uh, certainly the bit vector size, the size of each of these bit vectors. This happens to be as many bits as uh, the pattern string is long. Um, then we need to store three out of these four bit vectors because, well, one of these is just the um, shifted version of the other, so three of them are sufficient. Um, and then we have the loops, so the outer loop and inner loop. Um, so this k, by the way, is a edit distance threshold, the ma not maximum number of edits considered. Uh, so what's crucial here is that this is uh, several terms multiplied together. And let's say we assume um, text and pattern lengths of 64 um, and a single warp of 32 threads. And recall that one thread works on one copy of this data. Um, we get a footprint of 64 times 64 times 3 times 64 bits from this from the previous formula times the 32 copies for each thread. Um, and this is like 69 kilobytes uh, times 32, three megabytes. This is a lot. <laughs> um, the shared memory capacity of the uh, Ampere SMs is 99 kilobytes. So per SM, you can have 99 kilobytes of memory, but actually our algorithm as we wrote, as we implemented it right now, needs three megabytes. So clearly this uh, implementation would fail because simply we are out of uh, shared memory, either at compile time or at runtime, you would get an error. So for our third implementation attempt, uh, we can try to rewrite um, the code for GPUs specifically um, and try to rewrite it such that it's a thread cooperative manner. So you have can have, let's say, 64 threads in a thread block and have them cooperate uh, on a single sequence pair. Then still we store the deep table in shared memory and hopefully we can that way actually now attain this uh, yeah, compute bound case. So uh, how do we map these threads to um, cells? Clearly we need some kind of parallelism if they want to cooperate. So this is the table that we're trying to calculate and uh, indeed it turns out, um, so they figured this out in the genasm work in the original one that uh, yeah, you can map threads to columns in the table. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there needs to be some communication between these threads afterwards, but uh, at least you can somehow work on these columns in parallel. 
So, uh, yeah, by the way, that's why I said there's 64 threads here. You can have uh, one thread per column. And if you assume text and pattern are again 64, we can use 64 threads. Okay, we use 64 threads in one thread block. And this gives us a footprint of this uh, formula as before times one because they all cooperate um, is 96 kilobytes. And indeed, um, as we had before, this fits into the 99 kilobytes of uh, shared memory in the Ampere SM. So this is nice. Um, we at least got it to run for now, <laughs> uh, but now we get into uh, some performance issue. So as I showed, this fits barely one instance, right? We can fit one thread block of 64 flats. At least it, it, it can only be active at any given time. You can only have one uh, active thread block in the SM because, well, you can fit only 69 kilobytes once into 99. Um, and having only one thread block in an SM, if the thread block is only 64 threads, it's really not enough to saturate the SM. So we call this low occupancy. And this is bad. Um, occupancy should be high for good performance, such that the simultaneous multi-threading and GPUs uh, can hide instruction latencies. But for the uh, simultaneous multi-threading to work, we need many active warps. Um, and clearly, this would be only two active warps of 32 threads. That doesn't give us sufficient latency hiding for good performance. Uh, if you want to get more background on the, on this uh, kind of occupancy issues and why it's exactly needed and how this uh, SMT works here, you can refer to our previous lecture. Um, so Juan presented here many uh, performance considerations, including these occupancy issues. Um, but uh, for now, uh, let's, let's, let's set away this uh, attempt and say, okay, it will have low performance simply due to this low occupancy. It works, but we were kind of limited due to the memory capacity, right? If our memory capacity was much, much lower, um, this would have been great. We could have fit maybe more thread blocks, but as it was, we could only fit a single one and uh, that gave us bad performance. So at this point, we can get to our recent work, Scrooge. And what we did in Scrooge um, is algorithmically improve uh, the Genasm algorithm. And of course, then, uh, yeah, as part of it, we did a GPU acceleration um, also. Oh, we present this in HiComb just this May, it's a workshop um, in genomics. And uh, yeah, it's a short paper is currently available in archive. You can see the link down below here. So uh, let's quickly look at an executive summary here. We went over the motivation here. We need fast pairwise sequence alignment and uh, Genasm is this kind of highly efficient state-of-the-art algorithm it was really, really good also in hardware. Um, and it has some parallelism in there. We're motivated to explore it on GPUs. And we observed that our, there are some inefficiencies in there. And in particular for now, we should lo look at this memory footprint issue, right? For right now we're fighting the occupancy um, problem on the GPU. So we're mostly interested in this large memory footprint problem. Um, so our, our goal was to get these fast and efficient implementations for a variety of platforms. And um, what we actually figured out is that we can get some algorithmic improvements for the Genasm algorithm. So the mostly relevant ones here are Sene and Dent, which uh, address the memory footprint issue and also reduce the data uh, movement. Uh, and we're actually able to show that this give quite significant speed ups, just these algorithmic improvements, especially on GPU. Um, so let's look at why this was. Why do we get such high speed ups, almost 6x? Um, so we figured out that uh, in the DP table, um, the original JASM algorithm stores three edges. Right? In, the, in the pseudocode I showed, these were bit vectors. If you draw it as a table layout, these are really these arrows or edges between cells. Um, and it stores three of these per cell. And what we figured out is that it's actually sufficient to just sort the, end, the cells themselves. And when we need uh, the edges during traceback, we can just regenerate the arrows that we need during that time. Um, 
And since this one is only one bit vector per cell instead of three bit vectors per cell, this gives us immediately a 3x reduction in memory footprint at data movement. That's our first improvement. We call this CNS or entries not edges. Now for our second improvement, um, we, we observe that uh, certain areas in the DP table are actually never reached by the traceback step. So this is related to um, one of the performance improvements in the GNASM algorithm, the windowing heuristic. Um, and I will refer to yeah, the original GNASM paper on, on how that exactly works. But the point here is that the traceback step in this table never reaches the right half of each bit vector and it never reaches the right half of the table. So what we can do is at runtime simply never store these. We do need to calculate these areas, but we never need to store them for traceback. And this immediately gives a 4x reduction in memory footprint and data movement. So with these two improvements, uh, Sene and Dent, uh, we can get to our fourth implementation attempt, which I will call Scrooge. And uh, we again have threads that cooperate uh, in, a, in a thread block, use shared memory, and now we also algorithmically reduce the memory footprint. Right? We had these two improvements that improved by 3x and 4x respectively. And uh, together actually they combine very well and you get a 12x total reduction in memory footprint at data movement. So this is really nice. Now let's, let's check the memory footprint again of this implementation. Let's assume again text and pattern are 64 characters long you get uh, 12 thread blocks. So notice I already scaled up the thread blocks because we have a 12x reduced memory footprint and we can use 12x more thread blocks. Um, so the calculation kind of works out. We, we save half of the table, half of the bit vectors, um, and we only store one a bit vector per entry. And uh, well, this uh, allows us then to use 12 thread blocks instead of only a single one because for each single thread block the memory footprint is only 8 kilobytes and these 96 kilobyte total fit into the shared memory capacity of an A6000 GPU. So this is really good because these 12 thread blocks are enough to what, to what we could uh, call high occupancy. This gives us high performance actually um, yeah, much, much higher than uh, than what we had without these algorithmic improvements. Um, so you, I, I can show you some proof for this. This is not all hypothetical. Um, so here we have uh, in, in green, we have the full algorithm with all our improvements. There's Sene and Dent and actually some third optimization, which does some uh, reduces the computational workload. Um, but mainly what the, the speed up we get here is um, yeah, occupancy because the stent and Sene only implementations um, have lower occupancy. They also get significantly lower performance. And you should really have a forced line here that says Genasm without either Sene or Dent. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, if you cannot run it in practice with our implementation because our implementation uses slightly more than 96 kilobytes um of uh, memory so you can barely just barely not fit it into sram uh into shared memory at all even with a single thread block per sm so um if if you could run it though it would the the bare bones genasm would only scale to one thread block per sm which would be a line like down here um as as that's basically where these lines start out so really the gap from down here or down here to up here is the increased occupancy. Um, so yeah, this, this uh, I guess all these steps together, right? We, we have PR cooperative with many threads in a single thread block, plus actually uh, multiple algorithmic changes and together we get kind of decent performance on a GPU. Okay, so 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 that's, that's uh, this aspect of it. And now I actually also want to show some really nice, um, let's say low level uh, implementation considerations that we made. So as one of the pre-processing steps in the GNASM algorithm, 
we need to generate pattern bit masks. Um, what, what we have to do is we come from an ASCII encoding of the data and we have to go to some kind of uh, one hot or one cold encoding of the pattern string. So a, a one hot or yeah, one cold encoding in this case is um, you have four bit vectors, um, a bit vector for the character A, a bit vector character for the character C, G and T and so on. Um, and they have a zero in the respective bit vector uh, if there's that character at the given location. So the last character here is an A in the pattern, thus the last um, bit in the A bit mask is a zero. Um, similarly, let's say here for the C character, the C bit mask has the first bit um, zero because, well, there's a C as the first character in the pattern. Um, now the challenge here is how do you um, efficiently compute these bit masks? What you certainly could do is some kind of serial implementation. Um, so you first initialize all bits to once, then you go over every character in the uh, pattern and for each character set the appropriate zero um, in, in one of these bit masks to a zero. Um, yeah, so this kind of works, but it's really bad because there's no parallelism. Um, so only one thread block would do all the useful work in the uh, on, sorry, sorry, only one thread in the thread block would do useful work and all the other threads either do redundant work or no work at all. Um, this is bad, right? So what we realized uh, is that one of the most <laughs> standard, um, uh, yeah, patterns in, in uh, GPU computing uh, can be applied here. Um, it's parallel reductions. So what you can do instead is to initialize the bit vectors to all ones um, and then have each thread uh, have it. So these, these are local copies of the um, bit masks really. And uh, then you have each thread set in its own bit mask only a single zero. So at this stage, uh, each thread has a set of bit masks with, with only a, a single zero in it. And then you can merge all these bit masks together um, with a parallel reduction. So you can either manually implement this parallel reduction uh, using such a loop. Um, so it would be backwards compatible for, to, to older uh, yeah, GPUs. Um, and in more recent GPUs, there are actually even specialized instructions that uh, can do this. So you have one instruction that does this kind of um, bitwise AND over all threads. Now, this is uh, much better because you have a large amount of parallelism. Every thread um, in the block does useful work. And uh, the, yeah, mainly the speed up you get is that this loop here is much, much shorter than the loop that we had before. Before the loop ran over the entire pattern and here it it's, it's kind of a, a logarithmic length loop. Um, so you can find more uh, you can find out more about parallel reductions in this uh, yeah parallel patterns lecture by Juan um, from this earlier lecture in the PNS course. So uh, this was one, one of those uh, considerations we made, and uh, another nice one is uh, how to resolve uh, data dependencies. So if you recall, we had um, yeah, we, we have many threads cooperate on calculating this DP table and we mapped the threads such that one column is calculated using a thing, single thread, the next column is calculated using a different thread and so on. And um, inherently from the algorithm you get some data dependencies. So you get um, top down and right to left data dependencies. This uh, has nothing to do with the GPU implementation but it's simply inherently in the DB table, that's the order you need to calculate it. Mm, now there are two kinds of data dependencies in here, right? There's the vertical ones, which stay within a thread, and there are ones that cross across threads from right to left. Um, and uh, yeah, this is this order of calculation. In the, first, in the first iteration, you can only calculate this entry, uh, and then from the data dependencies in the next iteration, you can calculate these two. This, in the third iteration you can calculate these and so on. 
Um, and now the question is, how do we actually resolve the data dependency? So yes, we, we, we show we can do it in this order, but how do we actually communicate the data? What's the um, actual mechanism to communicate the data between threads? So what, what we can do uh, is do memory access all the time. Um, but this is kind of undesirable because then we need to have every thread write to memory every time and um, read back from memory and as kind of high latency, high bandwidth, it's, it's really not optimal in any way. Um, so register accesses would really be preferred and this works trivially if the data stays within your own lane, right? Uh, so a GPU thread can access its own register without any problem. Um, but where it gets challenging is these inter-thread dependencies. So we somehow need to move this data over here to the next neighbor thread for the next iteration. Um, can we do that using registers? And uh, it turns out, yes, if you followed uh, this lecture series. So there are these warp shuffle instructions in CUDA. Um, so, as a screenshot from the uh, CUDA programming guide, <laughs> these, these intrinsic shuffle sync, shuffle up sync, shuffle down sync, shuffle XOR. Um, in our case, uh, yeah, shuffle down sync, I guess, is what we needed. Um, so, we shuffle values down by one, right? So, down means from a higher thread index to a lower thread index. Um, and, yeah, this, this, uh, Shuffle instruction can do exactly this. So by its description, it um, permits exchanging a variable between threads of a warp without the use of shared memory. So this is exactly what we need. Um, and then, yes, we might note here that it says only within a warp. So to do the remaining uh, communication across warps, because we have a thread block of more than one warp, we actually still do need some um, memory accesses, but it's at least not as much as before. Yeah, if you want to find out more about these uh, warp shuffle instructions, um, you can check out this parallel lecture by Juan. Uh, so uh, again, this parallel patterns lecture, it's a really nice lecture. And um, yeah, let me uh, conclude um, with some numbers here. So in an early stage of the project, we got to some throughput number. Uh, of 1,800 alignments per second on some configuration of our data set and GPU. Um, and by the end of the project, we were at something like 25,000 25, alignments per second. So this is like over 10x improvement in throughput. And we applied all these um, yeah, techniques that I showed. So among them, uh, using shared memory, using a threat cooperative uh, implementation, um, algorithmic improvements to reduce the memory footprint and get higher occupancy. Um, we use uh, parallel reductions to efficiently calculate bit masks. We use um, warp shuffle instructions to resolve data dependencies. And uh, in my own uh, conclusion, this uh, really ends up uh, being that um, optimizing GPU code requires a holistic view of the program. So ignoring any of the above aspects would uh, ruin the performance of the program. So if you were to go through our, our source code and, and remove any of these, it kind of breaks the performance. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, that's that um, about this project. Uh, if you want to check out some of our other PNS courses, especially bioinformatics, if you are interested in that, we have it on our website with many video lectures. And um, yeah, there's of course all of Professor Mutlu's lectures uh, also from computer architecture and advanced computer architecture. So thanks for your time and uh, hope to see you again. Bye-bye.